Now that we've provided some background on Gaussian distributions, we can turn to a very important special case of a mixture model, and one that we're going to emphasize quite a lot in this course and in the assignments, and that's called a mixture of Gaussians. And remember that for any one of our image categories, and for any dimension of our observed vector, like the blue intensity in that image, we're going to assume a Gaussian distribution to model that random variable. Uh, so for example, for forest images, if we just look at the blue intensity, then we might have a Gaussian distribution shown um, with the green curve here, which is centered about this value 0.42. And I want to mention here that um, we're actually assuming a Gaussian for the entire three-dimensional vector R, G, B, and that Gaussian can have correlation structure, and it will have correlation structure between these different intensities because the amount of RGB in an image tends not to be independent, um, especially within a given image class. Um, but for the sake of illustrations and keeping all the drawings simple, um, we're just going to look at one dimension like this blue intensity here. But really, in your head, imagine these Gaussians in this higher dimensional space. OK, but just to go back to what we were saying, we have a Gaussian per category, um, forest, sunsets, and clouds. But remember, of course, we don't have those labels of our images. We can't separate and analyze each one of those classes separately to learn the parameters of those distributions. Instead, what we have is this pretty nasty um, space of intensities mixed over all these different images. So again, if we just look at the slice along the blue intensity value, then maybe our histogram would look like this three hump distribution that we showed before. Um, so this is just a histogram over values in our data set, but we're going to take a model-based approach, and somehow we want to model this distribution. So the distribution over blue intensity in our entire data set. And the question is, how are we going to do this? Um, well, to do this, we're going to take each one of our category-specific distributions and simply average them together. So the resulting density is going to be an average of each one of these category-specific Gaussians. But this simple averaging assumes that each one of these different categories appears in equal proportion in our data set. So we have equal numbers of sunset, cloud, and forest images. But what if, for example, there are many more forest images than sunset or cloud images in our data set. Well, in that case, we'd want to more heavily weight um, the forest distribution in this mixture, in this average. So we would do a weighted average over these different distributions where the forest distribution gets higher weight in that average. More formally, we introduce a set of cluster weights, pi k, one for each cluster k. Um, so in this example where we're going to assume a model with three different clusters, which happens to correspond to the truth, where we have forests, clouds, and sunsets, we'd have pi 1, pi 2, and pi 3, where these weights are capturing the relative proportion of these images in our entire data set. And each one of these weights has to live between 0 and 1, and the sum of the weights across each of the clusters has to equal exactly 1. And so what this means is when we're doing our weighted average, and these are the weights that we're using in that weighted average, this is something that's called a convex combination. So remember, or I didn't actually mention this, so you might not know it, but it's a distribution. A Gaussian is a distribution. So that means if we look at all the mass, if we integrate over that distribution over um, our random variable, the sum is 1, probabilities add to 1, um, or in the continuous space, they integrate to 1. Now, when we're looking at this mixture model, if because we're doing a convex combination of these individual Gaussians, each of which integrates to 1, then the overall result is still going to integrate to 1, so it still provides a valid distribution. And then finally, to complete our mixture model specification, or mixtures of Gaussians in particular, um, not only do we have a mixture weight for each one of our different clusters, 
we also have a cluster-specific mean and variance term in one dimension. And remember that those means and variances specify the location and the spread of each one of these different distributions um, that comprise our mixture model. And when we're thinking about mixtures of Gaussians in higher dimensions, so I'm only going to go up to a picture in two dimensions, not really the three-dimensional Gaussians that we would be working with um, for this RGB vector, but two dimensions is as much as I can manage to plot, we end up with just a generalization of the cluster parameters I talked about on the previous slide. The mixture weights are exactly the same. That doesn't change or vary with dimensionality. But now instead of just a mean and a scalar variance, we have a mean vector and covariance matrix for each one of these Gaussians. So remember these means and covariances specify not only the location, but also the shape and the orientation of these different ellipses. And then when we're thinking about the mixture weights, it's pretty hard to annotate on these types of contour plots. Just think of taking each one of these distributions, which are shown in these green um, fuchsia and blue colors, and then weighting them. And this weight, pi k, is coming out of the board, out of the slide here. Um, and that represents how much we're emphasizing each one of these different mixture components in the overall mixture. And when we're thinking about using mixture models to do clustering, um, note that they can also be used just to do what's called density estimation. So estimate those types of curves over the histograms that, that we drew earlier. But in our case, we're going to focus in on the clustering application. And there, there's a really important other variable that we're going to introduce, and that is the cluster indicator, the Simon variable for every one of our observations. So we have, this is the cluster assignment for observation xi. So this is exactly the same variable that we had in k-means that was assigning observations to clusters, um, but in that case, just using the cluster center. OK, so let's step back and think about what our model is saying. And the first question we can think about is, what's the probability that the ith data point in our data set is associated with the kth cluster? So for example, when we're talking about our images, we could say, what's the probability that the ith image I see is, let's say, in the cluster of clouds images? And let's talk about this before we've actually observed what the image is. All we know is it's the ith index in our data set. OK, well, this is fully specified by the mixture weight, pi k, because that tells us how prevalent cloud images are in our data set. So that's given right here. And if we don't observe the content of the image, then we just are caring about how many cloud images do we have relative to forest images relative to sunset images. So we say that the prior probability that the ith image is assigned to cluster k is given by pi k. Another question is, what if I know that an image comes from cluster k? OK, so I'm going to fix that. I already know that it's a cloud's image. Now I can say, what's the likelihood of observing the RGB vector associated with this image, so xi, given that the image came from the kth cluster, this cluster of cloud images. And in this case, what we do is we simply go to, this is the distribution of cloud images, or distribution of blue for cloud images. And we say, OK, let's take this one image I have. This is my xi image. And I look at its blue intensity. And I say, under this distribution for clouds, how likely is it? Well, it's pretty likely. So it's a reasonable guess that, or it's reasonable to say that this was a cloud's image. But I can also look at this probability under, remember, this was the forest category. And I could say, well, what's the likelihood of this image under the forest category? Well, it's not that high. But on the other hand, what we know is that there are many more forest images in our data set 
than cloud images. So what we're going to be doing when we're going to form our soft assignments, which we'll talk about in the next section, is we're going to be thinking about weighting these two terms, saying, well, what's the prior probability that this image is from any one of these different classes? So in this case, it's most likely a forest image. But then I say, OK, well, now I've observed the content of this image, the RGB vector for this image. And I want to say, I need to weight that in. And under the sunset category, it's extremely, extremely unlikely. There's basically zero probability of observing this blue intensity value under that category. So I can rule it out regardless of what the weight is on that category. Um, but for these other categories, these other clusters, there's going to be some competition between how, how much I'm likely to just see images of that type versus how likely it is under that category. Um, and we're going to use both of these things to represent our uncertainty about the cluster assignment. Um, so just to circle back and make sure we're very clear when we're looking at the probability of an observed RGB vector, RGB for image I, given that it's in cluster K, then this is just a single Gaussian with mean mu K and covariance sigma K. And this is referred to as the likelihood term, whereas before we called this the prior term. And I want to point out that this image, indeed, there should be uncertainty about whether it's assigned to the clouds uh, cluster or the forest cluster, because here we see some, some trees. And here we see some clouds. So it would be natural to have uncertainty on the assignment of this image.